I hope you're settled in. The game we're about to see today was played by Dawid Janowski, a Polish international chess master who was known for insane sacrifices. Third world chess champion Jose Raul Capablanca said about him, when in form, he is one of the most feared opponents who can exist. You know because of the title that this game is insane. But let me put you a little bit more into context. This game, he started out against a NN, so not known of the opponent. But nevertheless, he started it off with a knight's odds, meaning he started this game without a knight on b1. Dawid Janowski started this game off with the white pieces and played e4. His opponent played e5, to which he played f4. This is known as the king's gambit opening. You see, on the Isle of the King, you are giving a pawn called a gambit in the opening, to which black accepted this gambit with e takes f4. When you're a piece down and you're giving another pawn on top of that, this is called being very bold. But white played this gambit as if nothing happened. Knight f3, playing theory, g5, defending this pawn, which is defended by the queen, so it's completely fine, and now bishop c4, hitting this pawn on f7, which is pretty weak, and going for quick development overall. Why do I say this? Because of the next few moves. Here, his opponent plays g4 to try to attack this knight and unlock for themselves the h4 square for the queen to check the king and to move the king out of there because literally g3 would not be enough. So let's say a bad move knight e5 to attack f7 and black already have queen h4 check, g3, f takes g3, threatening g2 check and winning a rook. This would be already completely winning for the black pieces. So already white are on thin ice. And Dawid Janowski does, does not care. He plays castle, you see here. <laughs> Little castles move. Starting it off, no more knights, <laughs> giving his second knight uh, for, for this game. And so his opponent just took, and he aims for insanely quick development with already having three pieces arguably in this attack and his opponent having next to zero. <laughs> And so now you have a bishop pointed at f7, this queen and this rook forming a battery and almost pointing at f7. I mean, you just take the pawn and you're triple on f7. So this pawn is a weakness that's going to appear in the very near future. And so black already stares down the barrel of a shotgun and defends this pawn needingly so. Queen f6, defending f4, and really this pawn to take is not worth it because queen takes, rook takes, and here black would be up two pieces, giving a pawn here, the pawn they won on f4 would not be worth it, given like f6 defending. So white needs to come up with more things, and so they do. They play this other questionable move, e5 here. Such a weird one, right? Why would white give another pawn, <laughs> additioned to the fact they gave up two knights? We'll know in the next few moves that come. But this is a very nice move because it's mysterious. His opponent doesn't know why he gives a pawn. And it's a tempo move, right? Black must respond, delaying their development as well, not moving any pieces while their queen has to move. So queen takes e5 is played. Okay, and now Dawid goes for a very, very passive looking move, right? d3, not an active move like e5. Why is the follow-up so dull? Well, here he's threatening this f4 pawn, and after that he can move his bishop and create a lane for his queen to hit f7. So this, again, is a very, very sensible, fragile pawn, and his opponent defends immediately. And now comes the brilliancy of the e5 move. You see, the queen is put on a terrible square. It's put on a terrible square because of this file on the king, and of this diagonal on the rook and queen. So how can we penetrate with these two weaknesses with one blow. So Janowski plays bishop d2 here, threatening rook e1 to pin the queen to the king, and also coming in with the double threat, threatening bishop d2 to c3 with a beautiful skewer on the queen and rook. So black looks like they're in trouble. And so here, the black pieces react with knight e7, first of all securing the major threat that was coming in with rook e1 pinning the queen to the king and winning a queen. 
So that is dealt with. And after bishop c3 by Janowski, you think you're winning a full rook on h8 with this beautiful skewer, but now black shows that they have another trick up their sleeve. And NN means usually it's an amateur player that's playing this in a simultaneous exhibition, that's playing this in a coffee house, that's playing in an amateur setting, right? So here white finds a very nice resource. Queen c5 check on the king first. This is called an in-between move, forcing the white pieces to move their king before anything else and putting their queen out of danger. And now he puts his rook out of danger with castles. Super nice, right? He dealt with four weaknesses in two moves, in three moves, 97. But albeit, it's really impressive. And now Dawid is kind of here with, okay, very nice bishop pair, okay, very nice battery, but no way to really improve here. I mean, all your pieces are in the attack, but there's no real way to progress. Yes, you can throw a check in, but the king looks quite safe after knight g6. So here, he plays the patient route. Uh, credit to him, rook e1. I would not be that patient in this position. Rook e1 played, he brings his final piece into the attack, unless you consider this king a ruthless piece, but I don't think that will happen this game. Rook e1 attacks the knight, but not really. It's defended, right? So, okay, you're placing a rook on a very open file and you're activating a piece, which is really nice. These are considered very active pieces. This is also an active piece, and these are all passive pieces. So they don't contribute to anything in this game. They're passive. They are blocking each other, like this knight and bishop are blocking the rook from centralizing. So it's really good for the white pieces that black have inactive pieces. So we continue here. Black comes up with a way to fix this problem of underdevelopment. And he goes for a very nice tempo move. d5, claiming back the initiative in this position by attacking the bishop and opening up the position for his bishop to develop, which will easy up this knight to develop, and the rook, and so on and so on. I reckon if these two pieces get out in time, the black pieces will have no problem beating Dawid in this game. But Dawid is really, really good at counterattacking here. You see, d5 is all good and fine if I move my bishop. If I do not call your bluff, I lean in, you gain the bet, and then bishop f5 is played, and then knight c6 is coming in, then it would be winning for the black pieces. But here, Dawid thinks outside the box, and finds a move that not only stops d5 in its tracks, but regains the initiative for his side. And that beautiful move is queen h5. Here, you're not only preventing d takes c4, because now you're pinning the pawn to the queen on the other side of the board, but you're also re-attacking, counter-striking against this bishop on h6. And so now what do black do? Because let's say I play takes, you cannot take this because I have checkmate. So I'm actually threatening this bishop without even a, a trade. It would be checkmate on g7. So here black plays kind of a weakening move, f6, to cut the diagonal of this bishop and to also take up this g5 square so that if white takes, you cannot mate, you cannot check the king, it's all good and well. Look, let's look at what if white takes. If you take this bishop, black nut doesn't just take on c4. They play knight f5 first, attacking the queen and forcing the queen to retaliate back, right? Let's go queen takes f4, let's say. And now the beautiful d takes c4 and this knight is awesomely defended and you relatively have no attack. Check king here or check knight g8 and here you can counter even the queen here on g4. So this is not a desirable option for the white pieces. So how do you pursue? Dawid Janowski plays rook takes e7, sacrificing a rook in this position. You are sacrificing not only a rook, but also the knight that you sacrificed early in the game and the default knight that you sacrificed on b1. So the sacrifices are adding up. Rook takes e7 has permission to deflect the queen off the defense of this d5 pawn. And so after queen takes e7, white activates again their bishop with bishop takes d5, 
with check on this king. So you don't only activate the bishop, but with tempo on the king, you gain the initiative, you gain the kind of juices in the position. Black plays the only really winning move in this position here. I mean, if you play bishop e6, white just has like rook e1, and the bishop is pinned, and it's not that desirable here. So king g7, a great move. This king is really, really safe in this position, and hats to the black pieces. But white are not done here. I mean, yes, your attack is losing steam. I don't really have check here. How does white progress? But they still have one piece that is not activated that should come into the attack, and that is the rook, rook e1. I don't know if this is luck, but it's beautiful coincidence that this bishop takes up that square, and so rook e1 directly attacks this queen. The queen has several options. Queen d6 is the best option by far. We'll see why that is such a good option, but queen c5 was played here. Okay. White easily gets a drawage position with like rook e8, but they go in for the kill here. So high risk, high reward, and they play rook e5. <laughs> no care whatsoever for material, just sacking other, another rook. At least this time the sack is like terrific. If you take, it is completely winning. I can confirm that. Bishop takes e5, check on the king. Rook f6 is the only move to defend, and then we're going to use this pin of the rook, the uselessness of the rook, to play queen f7 check, king h8, and checkmate. Though this did not happen in the game, so we don't have to worry about this. But why then did we play rook e5? It looks like just a useless move. To do what? It's a hard move to read. What are we doing? We're doing this, we're preparing a discovery with a bishop move on this queen. What are we doing? So black takes this question mark and says, okay, it looks like you're stalling or you're just like baiting me to take the rook. So I'm gonna play queen f2, threatening checkmate on f1. And in this position, the white pieces did not hold back, not even for one second. So, you know, just hold on tight here. The white pieces played rook g5, check on the king, brilliant move, sacrificing the rook one way, this pawn is pinned, cannot take because of the strike on the king. If the king goes back, it's a simple maiden two, white just has bishop takes f6 check, deflecting the rook off of g8, and if rook takes, we have rook g8 checkmate. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? So the matter of bishop takes g5 comes into play. This is forced move now because those are the only two options that black have. Bishop takes g5, Janowski takes back with the queen, again, self-serving on this pin like an ice cream machine. Check on the king. King is forced to h8, and he finishes this game off by sacrificing a queen above the rooks, the knights that were sacrificed in this game, and the two pawns at the beginning. Queen takes f6, sacrifices the queen, and forces rook takes to which after that, Janowski did not hesitate and played bishop takes f6. Checkmate on the king. Bishop pair checkmate on the king. Bishop pair checkmate sacrificed a knight, two rooks, and a queen on the king checkmate. I reckon his opponent did not play a chess game ever in their life after this was played. That's okay. It's very understandable. But I hope you enjoyed this masterpiece that reminds us of the beauty of chess. Thank you so much for watching and have a marvelous day on my behalf. And finally, let's look into the mystery of this rook e5 being a huge miss. Well, rook e8 was the better move, but let's see what black could have done instead of the queen f2, complete blunder, uh, to defend this position. So, rook e5, observing that this threatens maiden 4 with rook g5, here you need to observe deep down into what the white pieces threaten. So let's flip the board. And let's calculate. So rook g5, if we take here, queen takes, king back, queen takes. This is what happened in the game, by the way. So what needs defense here? And by looking at this, you can realize that this f6 pawn could help uh, by being defended a little bit more. So here the best move is queen d6 or knight d7. Either way, anything to defend this pawn. And that makes this sacrifice invalid. So now rook g5. H8, F takes is not possible, but after bishop takes, queen takes, king h8, and this is completely well defended. Bishop takes f6 is no issue because of queen takes, and in this position, not only black holds on, they are favorite to win this. Mm -hmm.